Today, our next presentation is a live feeds primer, the importance of plankton, where to get it, and how to, how to grow it uh, by Todd Gardner. He's a professor of, of aquaculture at Carteret Community College in Moorhead City, North Carolina, and an aquaculture specialist for Biota Inc., uh, which specializes, of course, in sustainably uh, cultured marine fishes and invertebrates for aquariums. His life and his career have been shaped by his passion for marine life, and he has written numerous scientific and popular articles about his research and experiences collecting, keeping, and culturing marine organisms. His professional background includes work on a National Geographic documentary, commercial uh, fish farming at Sequest Hatchery in Puerto Rico, and an 11-year term at Long Island Aquarium, where he spent much of his time developing techniques for raising difficult marine fish larvae. Uh, to date, he has raised more than 50 species, in 2013, Todd received the prestigious Aquarist of the Year Award from the Marine Aquarium Society of North America, MASNA. In his spare time, um, like many of us it seems uh, today, Todd, Todd dives, uh, photographs marine life, runs marathons, and plays the guitar. So help me in welcoming to the stage uh, Todd Gardner. Thank you so much for that nice introduction and thank you all for coming. Um, so, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about plankton and other live feeds, but uh, a, a tiny bit more about myself to kind of get us going. Uh, I live in Swansboro, North Carolina with my son, Finn. We pretty much begin and end almost every day with some part of our bodies in the water. This is our favorite beach where we go almost every night uh, at dinner time for a quick swim before we eat. We do spend a lot of time in the water. Finn is an avid spear fisherman and catches us a lot of our dinner, uh, dinners. And we're also food snobs. We take our food very seriously, um, catching and growing a lot of our own ingredients. And, um, and it's the same with our fish. Um, our fish, both at our home laboratory and, and at the college laboratory where we work uh, in partnership with Biota, um, our, we, we don't spare any expense at our fish's feeds. Our, we get, uh, our, our broodstock gets LRS frenzy foods and mastic foods and, um, and a lot of other fresh local things that we manage to catch nearby. But we're talking about live feeds today. So we, we also obviously need live feeds for what we do, which is culture difficult marine species. Um, and, and we need live feeds for other things too. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the different types of live feeds that are important to us, that might be important to you, and how to get them. So um, live feeds sometimes are important just as a supplement or enrichment if you have predatory fish. Maybe you want to give them something alive once in a while to keep them excited about eating. Um, some kinds of corals can do just fine without any live feeds, but getting some live plankton in there is becoming more and more popular, and we see how corals respond to it. It can also reduce waste from rotting foods. Um, if, um, if I'm going away for a whole day, or if I'm, if I'm going to be gone for part of the day or for a weekend, and I have some fish that can take things like live shrimps, I'll, I'll put a bunch of them in the tank instead of having to worry about an automatic feed or dumping too many pellets in the tank while I'm gone. Um, when we have a pregnant seahorse that we pull out to give birth into a rearing tank and it's gonna be there maybe for several days before it gives birth, but there's no filtration going on, the, on that tank yet, um, we'll, we'll feed it a couple of live shrimp each day instead of having waste from frozen foods going onto the bottom. Um, and then in some cases, there's just nothing else that will do. If you're, if you're raising difficult small marine fish species, you just can't get away without using live feeds. Um, if you're raising uh, filter feeding bivalves, you can't get away without using phytoplankton. So, so sometimes it's really your only choice. Um, these are some of the cool corals I kept back when I used to keep corals at the Long Island Aquarium. And these guys all were only able to, to uh, thrive in our filter feeder tank because of the live feeds that we were growing there at the time. Um, the first thing I want to start with is we'll talk about plankton and what it is. We'll, we'll talk about a few other non-plankton live feeds, too. Um, but first, let's define what plankton is. It's probably not what most people think it is. Most people think of plankton uh, as being microscopic plants or animals. That's how I often hear it defined. That's how it usually gets taught in the fourth grade science lesson. And, and for some people, that's as far as the knowledge goes. 
Um, it can be plants or animals. It's usually not actual plants. Uh, often it's animals, but really plankton can be any living thing that is in the water column and can't swim against currents, tidal or ocean currents. So they can be protists, they can be animals. Again, lots of the plankton that's important to us are actual animals, things like copepods. Many of them are protists, meaning they're just single-celled organisms that can include flagellates, ciliates, um, waterborne amoebas. But um, really, the, the term plankton doesn't have to mean small, right? It doesn't have anything to do with size. It just needs to be a living thing in the water column that can't outswim a current. So even really big jellyfish can be considered plankton. And we have lots of prefixes we put um, in front of the word plankton to describe what type of plankton they are. Things like nanoplankton and femtoplankton and uh, macroplankton and megaplankton indicate specific size ranges. Words, uh, terms like ichthyoplankton or virioplankton or bacterioplankton indicate what kind of organism it is. Uh, meroplankton or holoplankton are going to indicate whether they spend all or part of their life in the plankton. Um, so that's just a, a quick little summary of plankton. We hear this term, though, pods, very often in the aquarium world. I hear people talking about they want to grow pods or buy pods, or they put a funny prefix in front of the word pods. I have a pet peeve about this, so I'll make my annual appeal um, and uh, tell you what pods really are. Pods are feet, feet or other appendages. So I think we should stop calling our animals pods or feet. Um, after all, we don't call cephalopods pods, and we don't call gastropods pods, and we don't call tetrapods pods, and we don't call decapods pods, and we don't call myriapods pods, and I could go on and on, but I won't, because we'll run out of time. Pods is often put at the end of the name of some organism or its taxonomic grouping because it's indicating something about their feet, whether it has a lot of them or big ones or where they are. Okay, so some of the things that we do call pods, but we're gonna stop, <laughs> amphipods um, are usually pretty small crustaceans, uh, sometimes planktonic, very often benthic. Um, you, you can buy them, some of our fish like to eat them. What I notice about amphipods is they have a very thick exoskeleton, they're not super digestible. And even though I, I feed them to seahorses and I watch them poop out whole undigested amphipods, um, most of the studies I've read on seahorse stomach content analysis show us that amphipods are a very important part of seahorse diet. So it, it is probably a good idea to get amphipods into your seahorses and probably some of your other little benthic crustacean eaters. Isopods are kind of similar also a pretty thick exoskeleton, and they're more flattened. Um, they're, they're decapod crustaceans, too. Um, they uh, also, those little pill bugs and roly-poly bugs in your backyard also are isopods. Um, a few of them are small and, and make good food for things like dragonets and seahorses. They're not all good, though. Some of the most horrific parasites in the animal kingdom are isopods that get into a fish and eat its tongue and suck its blood and, and do lots of other awful things. So let's all say about isopods. Um, in the world of decapods, crustaceans, I'm only gonna mention shrimp and mention them briefly. Um, there's a lot of things we call shrimp, like mycid shrimp and skeleton shrimp and uh, mantis shrimp that aren't actually shrimp, but true shrimps are decapod crustaceans, and, and they're also a really important food source for a lot of our fish. And um, this one, the common shore shrimp, Palamonides pugio, um, often sold as glass shrimp or grass shrimp or, um, I don't know what else, ghost shrimp, um, are a good choice because they are estuarine shrimp. They, they can live in brackish water or fresh water or salt water. They stay pretty small. They do have a very sharp rostrum. So if you're feeding them to seahorses and they're a little on the large side, uh, that sharp rostrum can injure the seahorse's mouth or the mouths of other fish too. Um, one of my students last year asked me, can we please get cuttlefish? And I said, well, and, and I I often try to sell students on finding a cool little niche market like 
uh, shore shrimp and say, you know, um, these aquariums that have things like leafy sea dragons sometimes pay two or three or four thousand dollars a month just to buy post-larval pinnaid shrimp. That's the edible shrimp. They buy them from fish farms to feed their sea dragons. And I think this little shore shrimp would be a much better choice. It doesn't get as large and they're a lot easier to raise. And I think, you know, you should think about how you might make a living raising shore shrimp and finding this little market of selling feeder shrimp into the trade. Um, so last year when one of my students asked if we could please get cuttlefish, I said, I will get cuttlefish one way or another into this lab if you take up my shore shrimp challenge and start raising these shore shrimp. I'll catch you the shore shrimp. We'll, we'll get you a little corner of the lab. He's got a corner. He put a sign up called, and he writes, Crustacean Station uh, on this row of buckets where uh, he raises the shore shrimp. And, uh, and sure enough, he's doing a really good job. And, and uh, secretly, I also really wanted him to do that so that we'd have fresh live shore shrimp at all times to feed our seahorses and some of our other fish. And, and I think that's really helping spawn quality in the lab. So here's a little petri dish of some of his recently settled shore shrimp. This is a, an adult one that's got uh, full of eggs. We call it a buried shrimp because it looks like berries under them when they're holding eggs on their abdomen. Um, and I could go on and on about shore shrimp, but I probably shouldn't. Uh, another thing that we call a shrimp that isn't, the brine shrimp, or artemia, uh, I won't say too much about it, because I feel like in this crowd everybody probably knows about as much as I do about them, but these are crustaceans that live in semi-enclosed or fully enclosed um, bodies of salt water that tend to dry up, and so that little quirk of their habitat um, has caused them to develop these, the, these eggs or these cysts that can withstand drying out and can last a long time. So even though we've known and, and we see in study after study that they're nutritionally deficient compared to a lot of our other potential foods, they continue to be one of the most popular live foods in aquaculture and aquarium keeping because they're just so darn convenient. If you need a million tomorrow, all you need to do is hatch out a million eggs today. And they're pretty easy to grow up. One thing that um, people often forget, though, when we talk about artemia or brine shrimp is that 100% of these artemia cysts that you buy are coming out of the wild. They're, they're collected from the wild. Nobody's farming artemia. Some people grow them up and in batches to sell adult artemia or, um, or frozen nauplii or, or whatever, but, but nobody is farming artemia. They are 100% taken out of the wild and they're like any other seafood resource, they're being overexploited. They're just terribly convenient and so very hard to resist. Um, we uh, have known for a long time, though, like I said, that they're deficient. This, this is a bunch of brine shrimp in one of our grow-out tanks outside. And um, so we, we grow brine. We not only hatch them every day to supplement our larval feeds, but we also grow some out in the summertime when we can grow them outside. And we use them just as a little extra enrichment for some of our brood stock that Again, even though they're nutritionally not quite there, they do fish really perk up when they see brine shrimp. Um, also, all of our enrichment products that have ever been developed really are just attempting to make a brine shrimp nutritionally more like a copepod. Um, as a fun little uh, perk of having outdoor artemia tanks that we fill with sterile seawater, we get these masses of algae growth, uh, ulva and other nice green algaes that we can then harvest and bring inside without worry of bringing parasites and things in from the wild. We can feed this stuff to our tangs and urchins and other herbivores in the, in the lab. On to rotifers. Um, rotifers are another really popular live food in aquaculture, also terribly convenient, but also not really there nutritionally and in some other ways. Rotifers first made their appearance in aquaculture in eel grow-out ponds in Japan more than 100 years ago, where they would, they would collect wild eels, put them in ponds, and induce an algae bloom to help water quality. And rotifers sometimes would bloom up in these ponds and cause the algae to crash. They would, they would eat all the algae. It didn't, it didn't crash, they just ate it. Um, and then the eels would suffer from water quality issues. So 
Um, they started out really as a pest in aquaculture and ironically then got taken and used as food and really broke open the whole field of marine aquaculture back in the 70s when they were first used to raise red drum and then clownfish and gobies and dottybacks. Um, not all rotifers are necessarily suitable for fish food. Some of them have big anti-predator spines. Some of them are benthic. Uh, it's important to remember rotifers are an entire phylum of animals with lots of species and, um, and, and only a handful are really useful. The genus Brachionis is the most useful rotifer. And what makes rotifers so convenient is that they reproduce by parthenogenesis, which means that they don't need, they're, they're all females, they don't need males to mate, and they have a very fast turnover time. Um, so they can, they can populate a container or a pond very, very fast, so that you can grow rotifers rapidly. There's two real shortcomings of rotifers. Nutritionally, of course, they're not great unless you have really great enrichment product in them. Uh, and the other thing is their swimming motion isn't very appealing to most larval fish. So on to copepods, let's just talk about where this pod occurs in the animal kingdom. Um, so copepods belong to the crustaceans. This is a subphylum of phylum arthropoda. There's 10 orders and 13,000 species of copepods. They're common in fresh and salt water, arguably the most abundant multi-celled animal on the planet, so not surprising that lots of fish at some stage in their life eat copepods. Um, some are planktonic, some are benthic, lots of them are parasitic, so not all copepods are good copepods in our book. Um, lots of the things we have to medicate fish for in aquariums or our corals are copepods. And just to zoom out a little bit taxonomically, um, we see if we look at the whole phylum arthropoda and some of the classes in there. So we have um, the subphylum um, crustacea includes all these others. We have in the class maxillopoda has copepods and barnacles. So copepods are a subclass in class maxillopoda and that subclass has those 10 orders. Only three of those orders are important to us. These free living copepods, meaning they're not parasites, um, and they, they do some swimming around. The Calanoidea, Cyclopoidea, and Harpacticoidea. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. So copepods are great. We've known this for a long time. For 40 years, we've known that copepods probably are what we need to be feeding our fish. Um, if you give larval fish a choice between all kinds of different plankton, if there's a copepod in there that's in the right size range, they will almost always choose the copepod. Um, we usually have adults and nauplii in, in a, a tank, whether it's a culture tank, a larval tank, a mesocosm tank, and this means there's always a variety of size, uh, sizes in there. That can be a good thing uh, in your larval tank. Their swimming behavior, unlike rotifers, triggers a feeding response. They, the way they move through the water is appealing to larval fish. Um, what we know about larval fish nutrition, marine fish uh, in particular, is that they need a high proportion of DHA to EPA. These are fatty acids that they use to build fats and other molecules in their bodies. They need a high DHA to EPA ratio, and that's what copepods have, and that's what we try to achieve in all of our enriching products. Um, they also um, have very often living copepods are going to have enzymes in them that larval fish need to get into their gut to start digesting foods in the first place. When, you, when, you, when a larval fish doesn't have these enzymes that it can't produce itself, it's sometimes unable to properly digest what it's eating. Um, so, and, and in so many experiments over the last 30 years, we've seen that feeding copepods to larval fish invariably produces better results than feeding them anything else. Um, in fact, my very first article that I ever wrote for the aquarium industry was about, was in uh, Fama magazine, and it was about a contaminating rotifer that showed up in our cultures and caused, caused rotifers to crash, um, but had the impact of giving us, giving us suddenly much better survivorship in our dotty backs. We'd get, up until this point, without using crazy amounts of antibiotics, 
we would get on average about three dotty backs through in a spawn of a thousand um, until this copepod came into the picture. And we, we did our best to perpetuate it. We didn't have the means to isolate it and have great cultures, but wherever we could, wherever we could get this copepod spread out to, we did. And whenever they bloomed up in our larval tanks, we got better survivorship on the dotty backs. And, and if not for all that, we might not have the variety of dotty backs in the trade that we have today. A few years later, I did uh, my master's research with seahorses, and I didn't have the ability to grow any copepods at that point, but I would sieve copepods out of the wild plankton, and I fed um, a number of um, batches of seahorse fry copepods from zero to five days before switching them over to Artemia, because that's about all the copepods I could come up with. And in almost every case, the greater the number of days on copepods, the better survivorship we had in the seahorses. Um, so this, this slide right here is actually about 10 years old, but I threw it in anyway, because it, it still mostly applies today, and, um, and, and we're still not quite where we need to be. We've come in a, a tremendous way with the copepods that are available, available to us today that have been isolated and made available um, and, and that we now have the ability to grow and feed to our larvae. Um, but they took a very long time to get here and we're still not where we need to be. So uh, one problem is that they don't produce the same biomass. They don't produce at the rate of something like a rotifer. We've gotten spoiled by rotifers where we can get hundreds of rotifers per milliliter in a culture and we just can't do that with copepods. Um, they also don't have that steady growth curve. They have a much more complex life cycle, so you have um, not a consistent supply of copepods typically in a culture. Um, and, and, we, and we're still new at it. Um, and also, some might argue that this isn't true anymore, that the ideal copepod is elusive. Um, Parvocalinus probably is as close as we get to the ideal copepod. Um, but I was talking to Kevin Barden the other day, who's responsible for almost every yellow tang available in the world right now. Um, and he's growing them, and they, they feed him parvocalinus, and it's an important food source. But he says, this is not the ideal copepod. We haven't found it yet. We can do better. That, that copepod we need to do better with tangs is still out there somewhere, and we need to find it. So again, they have a complex life cycle. Um, oh, I did not mean to do that. Some, somebody, <laughs> somebody should not have turned me loose with experimental PowerPoint techniques. All right, um, so uh, they, have, they start out as an egg. There are six nauplier stages. Um, five copepodite stages, uh, and then the adult is that sixth copepodite. Um, their lifespan depends on environmental conditions, most notably temperature, um, and, and also species, and, and their lifespan can be from days to months. And their reproduction is 100% sexual, so that males have to find females in order for this to work. That always complicates things. Um, so here's a, just a quick drawing of the three orders of copepods that are important to us from left to right. We have the Calanoidea, the best one because it is the best swimmer, Cyclopoidea, um, and Harpacticoidea. And one thing you'll see is a trend of decreasing antenna size as we move from left to right. Um, and keep in mind, although copepods have copious amounts of pods, lots of legs, that's what they're named for, uh, they, they accomplish most of their swimming with their antennae. So uh, they're beating that pair of antennae in the front and that's what's uh, creating locomotion for them. And so the longer the antenna, the better swimmer they are. The shorter antenna, the more likely they're gonna be to grab onto the bottom or the side or your, your larval fish and annoy them. So we try to steer clear of harpacticoid copepods with delicate larvae, but things like seahorses are just as happy to eat them as anything else. So here's a, here's a calanoid, here's a cyclopoid. Uh, Apocyclops is a typical cyclopoid. Parvocalinus and acarsia are two of the most popular uh, calanoids in culture. Uh, and then we have uh, tisbe is a harpacticoid. It's almost 
almost fully benthic. Most of them have pelagic uh, nauplier stages, so they'll, they'll swim around in the nauplier stage and be useful as food, but as adults, in a, in a tank of delicate larvae, you don't want to have lots of clingy little crustaceans that are going to want to attach to your fish or get out of the water column by going down to the bottom. Um, they can do some good. They can help keep algae films off the walls of your tanks to some extent, but they're not really useful as food. Um, this is a nauplius of, does anyone know what copepod this is? It's not a copepod. I put it up there to trick you. A lot of crustaceans begin life as a nauplius after they hatch out. So nauplius is a, a general term for the first larval stage of many crustaceans that usually doesn't feed in that first stage. So this is actually a barnacle. And if you remember back from the, uh, from the uh, taxonomy page, I showed you that the, the barnacles and the copepods are um, in the same class. They're very closely related, maxillopoda. Uh, as far as copepod culture, I'm not going to go into great detail because, at least in my world, it is not uh, really all that complicated. I use relatively small tanks. Sometimes I use five-gallon buckets up to about a 20-gallon barrel like this, and standing water with just very light aeration and pretty light feeds compared to what I would give rotifers. Um, I'm not trying to avoid giving you a, a specific formula. I just don't use when I, I grow copepods like I cook. Uh, I don't measure anything. But I, I just slightly tint the water with a variety of algae, and I'll talk in a few minutes about what the uh, important algae are for feeding them. Uh, but first, I went on and on about how awful artemia are compared to copepods, and I have to admit that sometimes um, these things that we believe aren't always true. And Finn is going to actually come up for one second and tell you a quick story about an animal that he's got in one of his tanks and what we found about it. Hello, thank you. My name is Finn Gardner, and I'm going to be telling you about my anemone. My anemone, we feed him brine shrimp and Sometimes we don't, and we feed him rotifers, and when we feed him rotifers, he gets all tucked up, and he is not happy. He does not like it. And when we feed him brine shrimp again, he loves it, and he, is, and he gets to be like he is in this picture. Um, we have tried putting fish in there, and all of them have been stung to death by him. And we have had one fish in there that has survived. It is the parrotfish, and it has a special mucus that prevents him from being stung. And we have had both of these for three years, and that's basically it. The point is, my dad isn't always right. <laughs> Truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Um, so, and, and to continue on that thread, that, that's not the only case of me not being right, believe it or not. Um, in, in this case specifically, um, my good friend Alyssa Gabriel of Seahorse Savvy and our Aquarist of the Year this year, um, for years I've been telling Alyssa you really should take up growing your own phytoplankton and copepods and rotifers. You could do so much better. Um, I know, you know, she told me she's pretty much just feeding the babies artemia, and I thought, how can you do that? I mean, I, I know about raising seahorses. I did my darn master's thesis on it. Uh, you need to listen to me. You need to raise these things, or you need, to buy, you need to get these things in there. You can do so much better. And then, a couple of years later, I stopped by and visited her hatchery, her farm, for the first time, and I looked around, and I, I felt like such an idiot. I said, oh my god, she couldn't possibly be doing any better, because every tank is full of seahorses at all sizes, and I've, I've never come close to producing seahorses like this. And I don't know what she's doing with those brine shrimp, but I've, I've never seen more happy, healthy seahorses. And uh, so, once again, I was wrong. <laughs> 
Um, so uh, we're going to talk about phytoplankton. Some of the most abundant phytoplankton on the planet are diatoms, which are really important foods for things like bivalves um, and, and even our little copepods. Um, and, and in aquaculture, we tend to look for phytoplankton that we can grow and feed to our zooplankton that we're going to feed to our babies, but that we can also put into our larval tanks. Anyone who's raising difficult larval fish knows that you have to get live phytoplankton into your larval tanks. And uh, phytoplankton that have glass shells with long spiky things on them aren't necessarily great for your larvae. Even if they're microscopic, they can puncture gills and cause irritation. So this uh, Didylum bright welly, one of the spiniest, sharpest diatoms out there, is one we steer clear of. Um, we like things with nice soft bodies like isochrysis. Another consideration if you're going to take up growing phytoplankton, whether it's to uh, feed directly to something or to be part of the food chain in your hatchery or, um, or your fish room, is that you need, to really, you need to be realistic about how much space it's going to take to raise the amount that you need. And so you need to keep a basic ecological principle in mind which is that in any ecosystem, there's far more producers than there are anything else. This is our, our basic ecological trophic pyramid. Energy enters at the bottom. We have a huge biomass of um, plants or photosynthesizers, and then much fewer herbivores. And then as we go up, and, and, and most of our, um, most of the fish that we're trying to raise, or, or shrimps, or whatever it is we're trying to raise, are somewhere in that mid-level. So, if you're going to try and produce enough phytoplankton to take care of all of your mid-level organisms, then you're going to need to devote a lot of space to it. You can't get away with one tiny little closet to, um, to, to feed a whole big room full of larvae. So uh, I'll show you a few pictures of some of our phytoplankton cultures. This is at Carteret Community College. This is our, our shared algae space with the college and biota. Um, we've got here uh, secondary cultures. We start with primary cultures and then move them into these um, glass bottles where we get them up to a certain density and then we transfer them on into larger cultures. Right now we're using these uh, translucent plastic bags that are um, pretty durable. We, we, we get these long uh, tubes of plastic and then uh, heat seal the ends and poke a little hole in there for a spout and we'll, we'll uh, fill these things. They're sterile when we start and we put pasteurized salt water into them and then, um, and then add nutrients and then inoculate. And then we can drain each of these down because there's very little opportunity for, um, for contamination to get in there. We'll drain these tubes. We keep a, a positive pressure. The air is going in in a, a tight little hole in the bag and and escaping through a very small space. And so that positive pressure that gets kept inside the whole bag keeps contamination from getting into it. So we'll drain these down and then refill them with pasteurized uh, nutrient uh, enriched water several times before they start to crash. You can't keep the contamination out forever, but we can sometimes rebloom it several times. Um, so there is some plastic waste, it's not ideal. Uh, the alternative is we use these fiberglass tubes, which we can uh, reuse many times, but we have to use a lot of chemicals like bleach and acid and, and detergents and scrubbing in between, and eventually they get all scratched up from the scrubbing and, and you know, they don't last forever either. Um, so it's kind of a matter of preference which of these things. One, one thing that um, I'll say though is it, it really helps to have a more vertically oriented vessel for raising algae in, in these larger cultures to help keep things in motion. Um, this is we our primary cultures we keep under a fume hood, and this is a little a stirring device that it, that thing swirls around on top and keeps those little flasks in constant motion. Your primary cultures need to be sterilized in order to keep a, a good line going. Uh, you can't necessarily keep it going forever, um, but if you get what they call an azenic culture, a culture that comes from a reputable lab where it's guaranteed to have no other organisms in there other than your target species, uh, then 
theoretically, you should be able to keep those going for a long time if you use sterile technique and, and sterilize these things. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the sterile technique in a second. This is my home uh, algae room. Um, I have some carboys here. There's two different styles I'll mention if, you, if you're thinking of getting into algae culture. Um, this, those large ones on the left come from a company called Northern Brewer. They're primary fermenting uh, tanks that they use for brewing beer. And they're great, they're polycarbonate, they can withstand pasteurizing, so if you wanna drop a heater in and, and raise the temperature, they won't melt on you. You can't boil them, they, they will melt at the boiling point, but you can get them pretty hot. Um, they're, they're chemically resistant. Um, they're about 40, they're up to about $48 now. Um, on the right is a similar material, this I got from Walmart for $12. It's a little bit smaller, um, it's almost as durable. Um, and uh, it seems like a great value if you do that instead of the $50, um, it's called a big mouth bubbler if you go to look it up. Yeah? I would always love to use glass more, but when you get into this size, glass becomes very heavy. Um, and I haven't found a glass bottle that has a large, it's really important to have a large mouth on there. When we use these glass carboys with the narrow mouths, you're, you're never getting a scrub brush down there. They make a whole line of scrubbing devices to try and jam in there and, and they break and wear out really fast. So if I can't put my arm into a, a culture vessel, I don't want it at all. Um, you can't use anything uh, abrasive in there because it'll scratch it up and then you won't be able to properly clean it in the future. Um, so I, I use soft stuff and I, I use bleach and acid. Um, the problem with these little $12 ones from Walmart is that the spout on it uh, doesn't stand up to the repeated uh, use. The, the bleach and the acid eventually get to it and it, it breaks down and that piece isn't replaceable. Any little plastic parts are gonna eventually break down, especially the rubber gaskets inside of these spouts and you need to replace them. But uh, Northern Brewer sells those spouts separately so you can buy them and replace them and keep that thing going. Um, Finn, incidentally, when he brings his friends over and they look in there, likes to say clever things like, and this is my dad's meth lab. <laughs> Here are my secondary cultures. I, I use all glass bottles for the secondary cultures. Um, and uh, another reason why I'm more picky about having to get my hand inside those larger ones is that I don't have the ability to sterilize them very well without using bleach in the water once they're filled. Um, so these are some, one, one uh, peak one and, one and, a, and a couple just inoculated. And my autoclave or pressure cooker that I use to, to sterilize the smaller glassware won't fit these in it, so I, I pasteurize them. So um, I'll, I'll explain the difference uh, here in a second, but this is, these are some set up for pasteurizing. I like these bottles for two reasons, well, for three reasons. They're thick, uh, they're really thick, strong glass. They're very much more vertically oriented than most of the other bottles available to me, and when you buy them, they come full of my favorite brand of gin. So that just really a lot of benefits to this particular bottle. Um, so uh, on the left is a $300 pressure cooker that is basically what a, what a, what a um, autoclave is. It's, it's just a chamber where you can raise the pressure to the point where you can heat water above its normal boiling point without it boiling away. Um, so it's important to have a pressure cooker with um, a, a temperature and pressure gauge on it. Um, and one that has a pretty tight seal too, so you don't blow up your kitchen. Um, so that's, I use, I use the uh, pressure cooker for all my small uh, primary culture, and that, that $300 pressure cooker I actually got at the thrift store for $20. Um, so um, so that's, that's sterilizing um, our culture vessels and media, I, and I always put the nutrients in before that point. You wanna make, you wanna make sure the nutrients are sterile too. And on the right uh, is, is pasteurizing. I just put them in a big pot and I fill the pot with water. I put aluminum foil over the tops of all of these things and I just let it simmer for uh, an hour or so. I, once it gets up around, you want, once, once I can see it's close to the boiling point inside the bottles, I make sure it goes for at least 20 minutes beyond that. So 
in pasteurizing, you're not necessarily killing every microbe in there, but you're doing a good enough job that it's going to last for a while. So it's a different degree of uh, sterility. It's not, it's not sterile at all, but it, it's, it's um, a different degree of purity than uh, sterilizing in a pressure cooker. And then these are my primary flasks. Uh, after they come out of the pressure cooker and have cooled down, um, we, just, we use sterile technique. Um, I take the aluminum foil off the tops and flame the tops, and then I use, uh, this is another little bit of waste here, but that's really important to the process, is I use these individually wrapped disposable pipettes for each transfer. Um, and then I, so I flame the top with the blowtorch before and after, make sure you have clean hands, and I, this is just my kitchen counter. Um, we also, uh, for fertilizer, we use the standard, what they call the F over two fertilizer solution. Some people say, well, can't I just use miracle Grow?" And, and you can, and you can grow a little algae with miracle Grow. but um, the, the limiting nutrients for marine algae are not the same as for your tomato plants. So these are formulated for marine algae. They have more iron. Um, if your fertilizer doesn't come in a two-part uh, solution, it's probably not as good because um, some of the minerals that they put in one part are uh, going to precipitate out if, they go, if they're at the pH of the other part. So you, you really shouldn't mix those two different parts together until they're diluted in the water. Um, as far as which species to grow, um, there's a lot of great ones out there. But um, if we just look at, uh, this is, uh, that's a, this is a copepod culture, and they show the, the mean growth of copepods using a couple of a few different algae uh, and their and combinations. So what we see is that Tetraselmus and Isochrysis gave the best growth of copepods. So that's what we use. Uh, we use we use pretty much a half and half Tetraselmus and Isochrysis to grow our copepods and to put into our larval tanks. But we also do grow other species. Um, uh, Bill Catman pointed out, he's been super helpful in us trying to figure out how to be better at urchin culture, that his urchins always did better when he got some rhodomonas in the mix, so we grow some rhodomonas too. We know that um, most of the copepods do better with some rhodomonas in the mix as well, but one problem is if you, you can't use all rhodomonas in, in a larval tank or put it in very densely because it really likes cooler conditions, so if you put it into a tropical larval tank, and it doesn't all get eaten right away, it's gonna die and just make um, you know, organic waste in the tank. Um, so some people start to think that this seems like an awful lot to go through, all this plankton culture, algae culture specifically. So um, you have options. You don't have to grow your own algae. You can still do lots of cool things in aquaculture and not be an algae culturist. In fact, the world's biggest consumers of uh, of phytoplankton for aquaculture, shellfish growers often don't grow any algae at all. Um, so you need to decide whether you're gonna grow algae or buy it. So um, some things to think about. Um, does your algae need to be alive? If it doesn't need to be alive, there are lots of algae pastes and algae concentrates and algae powders that you can use uh, depending on what you're feeding. If you're feeding uh, adult bivalves, you can use algae paste um, almost exclusively. If you're feeding larval bivalves, you probably should have some live algae in there. Um, if you're raising a batch of some really hardy estuary fish, like a black drum or a red drum, uh, you can probably get away with algae paste and rotifers. If you're raising uh, angelfish or tangs, there's, there's no way in the world they're going to survive without live algae in the tank. Um, and, uh, and, and another thing to think about, a lot of times when we're thinking about how hardy our larvae are going to be, we think, we, we think about hardiness in terms of the adults. We know that some of our hardiest marine fish that we keep in our tanks are damselfish and groupers, and they have notoriously difficult and sensitive larvae. I don't think anyone could raise a damselfish or a grouper using uh, dead algae in their culture water. And this gets even more confused because clownfish seem so hardy as larvae. We can, you, we can raise clownfish without live algae. And clownfish are the same family as damselfish, but we all know they're a lot different. So um, 
Hardy adults don't mean hardy larvae. Um, another thing to think about is as good as you might think you are with your sterile technique and your pasteurizing and um, sterile transfers, uh, you're, you're not as good as you need to be. And so um, this is just a, a funny little story. My friend Sonia, who I think is out here somewhere, maybe. Hi, Sonia is the uh, aquarist in charge of fish culture at the North Carolina Aquarium at Pine Knoll Shores. And we do this thing where we bail each other out when we have plankton crises. Whenever there's an isocrisis crisis, we bail each other out. So if uh, hers crashes, we get some from her. If ours crash, uh, what did I say? Anyway, you, you get the point. And, and then so I, I have my home lab. We have the lab at the college. And then we have uh, the uh, aquaculture uh, facility that um, Sonia runs at the aquarium. And we swap cultures when we need to. If her, she has a parvocalinus crash, we give her some, on and on. So um, a couple of months ago, she asked me for some isocrisis. Her isocrisis crashed, and I bloomed her up a little bottle in my meth lab, and um, I gave it to her, and she inoculated her, uh, carbo her, her uh, these, they call these Kelwall tanks. She inoculated them, and then a couple of weeks later, she texted me and said, was that isocrisis you gave me, or rhodomonas? And I said, it was isocrisis. She said, well, it's rhodomonas now. <laughs> so I thought, all right, well, I, I am getting old and forgetful, and maybe in the transfers, I, you know, sometimes at some point early in the culture, the, uh, the rhodomonas can look brown. I probably just accidentally made you a rhodomonas culture, um, and you bloomed that up. But that's great. That, that's useful, too. We, we, we'll take some back from you. So I made her another one, and I was very, very careful to make sure it was isocrisis, and I watched it bloom up, and I looked at some under the microscope, and I, I knew it was isocrisis, and I gave it to her, and the same thing happened. So um, what it turns out that my isocrisis, even down to my primaries, is contaminated with rhodomonas, but my algae room is so warm that it doesn't survive there. And if it's contaminated with rhodomonas, it's probably contaminated with other things, too. So... Uh, every time I give her isocrisis, her place is about 10 degrees cooler than my algae room, and the isocrisis dies off and the rhodomonas blooms up. And it's an important lesson because I think I'm pretty careful with my technique, even though I do it on my kitchen counter. Um, I, I bleach it first, and I use sterile technique, and I've had cultures going for a long time without crashes. But I know there's a lot of other microbes in there besides algae that I can't see. I don't have a good enough microscope to look at and identify bacterial cells. We know there's viruses in there. And so um, this thing that we sometimes do, like just swap algae with each other, um, can only go so far. And I was talking to Eric Sten of Algagen recently about um, he's done some, he's had some of his samples tested for various uh, you know, ubiquitous bacterial strains like Vibrio. Vibrio is a whole group of bacteria that lives free living and is very common in marine waters, but can opportunistically become very dangerous, and it's one of the biggest killers of our larval fish, and sometimes it's growing in our cultures. So um, he said, you know, I get the idea sometimes that uh, what's, what's happening out there is people have these mysterious die-offs happening, whether it's in their reef tanks or their larval tanks, and, and they're all, you know, people are blooming up algae and growing it and swapping and, and giving it away, and meanwhile, you know, they're, they're passing around Vibrio like STDs at a college frat party. And uh, so I thought, well, that's a really good point, and um, it drives home this point that we probably should, and, and I, it's something I've known. I, I always knew if I didn't start a brand new fresh culture about once a year, eventually I was gonna have a crash that I couldn't afford. I used to always, you know, all right, a year's gone by, it's time to order new cultures and start fresh. And I've gotten lazy because I've gone a long time without a crash, but um, it's, it's not just the threat of that crash that can happen once you get contamination in your cultures. And I don't, uh, I certainly don't have the means to keep that level of contamination out of my own cultures. So 
uh, some of the sources where you can get pure new cultures of algae. And, this, and, and with some species, there's no such thing as an absolutely pure strain. Isochrysis doesn't exist as what they call an azenic culture, meaning there's, there's, no one can give you isochrysis and guarantee that there's not already some other microbe in it. Some algae do occur on that uh, level of purity, though. Um, the Bigelow National Center for Marine Algae and Microbiota sells all kinds of uh, marine microbes, including lots of the algae that are important to us. Um, University of Texas has usually been my go-to for getting new uh, algae cultures. They maintain a terrific pure collection there. And uh, most of the shellfish growers uh, go to NOAA's Milford Lab, where they maintain 230 strains of phytoplankton. So these are all, if you want to really get into phytoplankton culture, these are your sources. Um, mo and they're not cheap. If they give a discount usually for educational institutions, but um, it's, it's not cheap to get a pure strain. For a lot of people, it really makes more sense to uh, either buy a, a partly bloomed up culture that you can just use for a while and rebloom a few times, or buy a blend that's already going to be useful and feed it out directly. And we're seeing more and more of the big producers of, of a lot of our favorite fish are doing things like that. It's just too much. It takes up too much space and effort and man hours to grow your own plankton. Um, so uh, some uh, of the sources that are out there that I would recommend, we have uh, Algagen. I always like to support Algagen because I do think that um, Eric is responsible for getting a lot of the important copepods to us uh, into the trade today. Um, obviously, reef nutrition, uh, uh, reed mariculture, um, they produce, reed, reef produces, uh, reef nutrition produces a whole line of products for aquariums and reef tanks, um, and then they also have uh, a, a rotifer culture uh, system where you're, you're dosing uh, algae in, in, into a, a rotifer tank, and you can produce really, really high uh, concentrations of rotifers in these things, plus, you know, algae products and copepod products. Um, and uh, Easy Reef is a new uh, company on the scene that uh, is based out of Europe and uh, now uh, distributing some of their products in addition to a variety of different fish foods. They also have some plankton products, and, and I, uh, we're going to be distributing some of those through Biota. So a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon and already out there in the way of um, producing or, or providing plankton to uh, your animals without having to grow it yourself. A um, couple of take-home messages from today. Uh, first one, stop saying pods. Uh, secondly, uh, be a food snob with your animals. Give them great stuff. Uh, don't spare any expense or effort to make sure they're getting what they need. But also understand your needs. Know whether you need to have live plankton or whether you can get away with one of the frozen or, um, or concentrated products. Um, remember your ecology. If you are going to get into plankton culture, don't underestimate the amount of space you're going to need to do it. You need more space for your plankton than you do for your fish. Um, check your arrogance. Otherwise, uh, things can happen, like you can be passing along uh, Vibrio and Rhodomonas unintentionally to people. Uh, you, you may not be as good at that as you think you are, and, and don't, don't underestimate the importance of those labs where they do have the means to keep those pure strains. And support those sources. Um, if, you, if, if we are uh, not supporting our sources of these products that we need, then they may not be there in the future. Just because you can bloom up a bottle of something green and give it to your friend, it doesn't mean it's what you even think it is. This happens an awful lot, too. People, I, I, I see people growing bottles of, of something, and they started with uh, nanochloropsis three years ago, and it's nothing like nanochloropsis anymore. It just happens to still be green. So uh, it, it's important to make sure you're supporting those sources of these things that we need so much. I'd like to thank all of you, especially uh, my, the entire Mazna family. Um, it's been 
so awesome to be back in person with everyone here. I think Finn told me six times yesterday that it was the best day of his whole life. So it really is a warm, welcoming, and loving place, and we love to be here, and we love all the support we've gotten from you over the years. Thank you, of course, to Biota Aquariums, who uh, pays most of our bills at home and uh, gives us an outlet for our passion for growing fish. Um, Carteret Community College also does the same and gives us a place to do it and really lets us get away with almost anything. It's one of the greatest places ever to work for. Of course, Finn, who helps me and puts up with me every day of his life um, and is starting his own little aquaculture project now, starting with cichlids. And uh, my team back at school, these are four of my former students who now work for Biota as well and help us out. Ben, Victoria, and James are holding down the fort at the hatchery. Zip, James's wife, is uh, staying at my house and taking care of the whole home hatchery. And quails, chickens, snakes, lizards, frogs, dog, and I'm uh, probably missing someone. And there they are, taking care of Trixie. All right, thank you all so much.